If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. If you're a guest today, uh, we just want you to know we are walking through the book of Matthew. We are taking it expositorily, line by line, and verse by verse. And uh, just to let you know what's going on, this will be uh, the last of my Matthew uh, series. Uh, we will start a Christmas series uh, next, and we'll go through the first, uh, through Christmas uh, Sunday on that. And then I have a New Year's sermon uh, for the last uh, Sunday in December. And then in January, we'll pick up and go with Matthew and keep going through that. If you have a bulletin and want to follow along with us, I'm speaking on today of the subject, Jesus' divine power. Jesus' divine power. And let me give you the outline. Number one, Jesus preached the gospel. John was a forerunner of Jesus Christ, and we have talked about him. And uh, he was the old school, all right? Uh, he, he was fire and brimstone, and he was fired up. Uh, Jesus started uh, more calmly if you just have walked through Matthew before. But I've noticed as it gets to the latter chapters, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees even get Jesus fired up. And uh, he, he chides them in several chapters there towards the end. So Jesus preached the gospel. Number two, Jesus healed the sick. There was not one person that came to Jesus that he couldn't heal. Not one. He had divine power from God. Number three, and this is the one, folks, Jesus raised the dead. I am telling you that is how powerful Jesus is. And, I'm, and, and I, just, I just get excited thinking about who Jesus was, thinking about starting his ministry, thinking about him touching people's lives. And the thing that you have to understand was him and his disciples walked everywhere they went. And so when you look at the area of Galilee, which we will be talking about, even though it's only 30 miles by 60 miles, they walked all that to cover a lot of those villages. There were some 200 villages in that region. And so you could see where uh, compared to today, you think about today, I, I could be at my house and I could be talking to someone in Japan you know, on a computer. And we have more tools, but there is nothing, listen to me, more effective than one-on-one -on -one witnessing. That is the most effective. Now, Jesus uh, poured his life into the disciples in those 12, and he ministered to the masses. But I am telling you, uh, he has given us that Holy Spirit inside of us to tell people the good news. So let's look at Jesus' divine power. Jesus preached the gospel. All right, Matthew 4, verse 23, and Jesus went about all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And when you think about Jesus in that area, uh, there was, it was more of a Gentile area. The closer you get to Jerusalem, it would have been a, more of a Jewish congregation. So he ministered to both. He went and, and started in the Galilean area, but still yet, every town, almost every town, had a synagogue in that town. And when you think of the synagogues in Jesus' days, they were Jewish synagogues, and they were the primary place of worship. It was also a place of study community fellowship, and legal or court activity. Jews who became Christians were disfellowshipped from the, uh, the synagogue, kicked out, ostracized. Worship was held every Sabbath, which began on Friday at sundown and ended at sundown on Saturday. During the Sabbath services, the law and the Old Testament prophets were read. They also prayed and they sang and had responsive reading. It, when you look at the text uh, from Scripture, it would be read out loud and expounded on. And Jesus did that many times. I read uh, last week about him reading Isaiah. And a synagogue was also 
uh, used as a public school for boys. So you could see where the, the Jewish synagogues was kind of the hub place in these villages where Jesus was. And there's three questions uh, I want to answer here in this first point. Number one, where? Number two, what? And number three, why? Okay, why? And when you think of Jesus doing teaching, you have to understand, folks, that there was something about him, and we know that it was God in human flesh. We know at the baptism, uh, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came down, and God said, this is my beloved son, who, am I, who I'm well pleased with. So he had an anointing that people didn't have. And, and we have the Holy Spirit. But because he was the son of God, when he spoke, people listened. And the scribes and the Pharisees and those rulers of these synagogues were jealous of Jesus because he was drawing crowds that they did not have. And folks, there are no competition in churches. We don't need to com com you know, even think about competing with other Baptist churches. We are all the body of Christ. And we need to understand, you know, uh, God has put uh, different churches here, and, and there's some 60 Baptist churches in Sebastian County. So you see there, folks, we need to pray for all sizes of churches. We need to pray for all of the pastors that get up every Sunday morning. So turn in, turn in with your Bibles, Mark 1. Look at Mark 1. Where? Where Jesus taught. Mark 1, verse 35. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight. Now some of you, you couldn't hang out with Jesus. Okay? You would be late for prayer meeting. All right? And again, I know we got morning folk. My wife is not a morning person. All right? We don't have any conversation till I get home at noon. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But if you look at Scripture, many times Jesus did two things. He got up early and he prayed alone. Do you realize that Jesus prays for you? The Word of God says Jesus prays for you. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before uh, daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. All right, he didn't always tell the disciples where he is at or where he was going. Okay, when they found him, they said to him, everyone's looking for you. Why are they looking for him? Because they realized even at the reading of the word in these synagogues, there was something different about uh, him. Don't you like uh, to hang around people that are enthusiastic? Don't you like to hang around people that love their job? Don't you like to hang around people that are trying to make a difference in life? Folks, that's what Jesus was doing. He was pouring his life into these 12 disciples so that he knew he was leaving and they would take over his ministry. Folks, we all have a ministry God wants us to do. And I know he can use somebody else, but he wants to use you. You can reach people that I can't reach or I'm not around. So Jesus was pouring his life into them. But he said to them, let's go into the next town that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. Come forth to what? Preach and to teach. So he was preaching the Word of God. He was teaching the Word of God. And word start, started around. You have to understand that in those days, again, no cell phones, no communication. Everything was word of mouth. And so when he started gathering these crowds, he literally had to get out of the synagogues because the group of people would not, you know, they, they couldn't handle it. Sheer numbers, they could not handle it. And so uh, word was getting out and he was getting to be real popular. And so we see where he started. He went from town to town. The second thing is what he preached. Look at John 
3, John 3, verse 13. John 3, 13, and if you, we, ha, we don't have time to look at the first part of chapter 3, but Nicodemus came unto him, and he basically said, we know you are a teacher that have come from God. We know you are do, doing miracles, and how are you doing this? How can you, how can you do what you do? And even ask him uh, the question, you must be born again. And it confused Nicodemus. He was thinking literally, you have to be born again physically. But Jesus was telling him, this is a spiritual matter, Nicodemus. And so he goes through this dissertation and he's trying to explain it to Nicodemus. But look at verse 13. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. Nicodemus saying, I am the Son of God. I am Jesus. I am God's Son, Jesus. So he's making it very plain. And then he used an Old Testament example that Nicodemus would be familiar with. And it's found in Numbers chapter 21. We don't have time to go there. Go there and read that whole chapter uh, sometime. But verse 14, as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. The people of Israel were griping about Moses and griping about, you know, being out here and saying they don't have enough food and it's the wilderness and you've done all this stuff. And it made God mad. God had the serpents bite these people because they were being disciplined because Moses was God's chosen leader. And in that text, it also says, if you have been bitten, he held up a cross. And he said, if you have been bitten, if you will look to the cross, you will not die. And he was, he was uh, you know, Old Testament-wise, showing what Jesus was going to do one day. I am telling you, folks, Jesus loved you so much that he gave his life for you on Calvary. And Jesus was trying to say, look unto Jesus. Look unto me. God has sent me here for a purpose. And that purpose is so that people might be saved. So people could repent of their sins and believe in Jesus Christ. And then in verse 15, it says, and whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Oh, folks, there's only one way to, to cry to Jesus Christ, and that's through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's through the cross of Jesus Christ. And then probably the most quoted scripture in all the word of God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Listen, everlasting life is forever. Don't miss the cross. Don't miss Jesus Christ. You will lose everything if you do. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Folks, he was the perfect son of God. And if anybody had a right to condemn, it was Jesus Christ. He had done nothing wrong. But I thank God that he takes sinners like me and sinners like you and restores life to us. He literally spiritually breathes life into us. So we see he went town to town. We see that he was preaching the true gospel. And then in Romans chapter 10, go with me to Romans 10. Romans 10, I love this scripture. Romans 10, 14. Peter, uh, uh, I mean, excuse me, Paul uh, gave the, the, the fa favorite, his favorite reference on how to be saved. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, you can be saved. And then verse 14, how then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? Folks, there's a world full of people that haven't believed in Jesus Christ. There are people in Fort Smith 
that have not uh, believed in Jesus Christ. That's why we have to find them. We have to invite them. Everyone is not just, you know, uh, you think about suspects. Everyone's a prospect, not a suspect. Everyone, everywhere needs Jesus Christ. And it says, and how shall they believe in him whom they not heard? If you weren't from the region of Galilee and you came because you had heard, you, 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 would, have, you would just been a dumbfounded probably. Who is, several times in the gospel, they ask, who is this man? How can he do what he's doing? And folks, it, it, it validated who he was. The Old Testament Messiah, the New Testament Jesus, who did miracles. And how shall they hear without a preacher? And I, I heard one time say, well, preacher, that's your job. Oh, really? Let me ask you, what do you do with the Great Commission? The Great Commission, that's for all of us, folks. We all should G-O go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the other uttermost parts of the earth. Verse 15, and how shall they preach unless they are sent? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Folks, we have the best news man can know. We have the best news that can happen to a person's life. Jesus started out, he went into all of Galilee and preached the gospel. You know what the gospel literally means? Good news. Good news. What's the good news? We don't have to die in our sins. We don't have to spend an eternity in hell. We don't have to. If we will believe and put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we can be saved. Now look at verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Folks, I am telling you, everyone in this room has faith. Did you eat out at a restaurant in the last two months? You had faith. You don't know who was in the back. You don't know how long he's been there. You don't know if, if his permit is real or not. But yet we just see it. we just eat them up. That's faith, folks. And faith is believing in God, not just believing, but believing in Jesus Christ, repenting of your sins. John and Jesus had the both their sermons always started with repentance. Repent of your sins and invite Jesus into your life. Folks, there's a whole lost world out there, and we need to be inviting, you know, like Jesus did, people to church and sharing the gospel with others. So Jesus preached the gospel. Number two, Jesus healed the sick. Look back in our text, the, the second part of verse 23, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. And folks, again, the healing part of it, Jesus had, you know, he was God in human flesh. He had that Holy Spirit power in him. And it, it, again, it, it just proved that he was the Son of God. He didn't heal to show off. He met a physical need so that he could talk about the spiritual need. You think of the parables and We'll cover them later on, and there was so many parables, but he told earthly stories with heavenly meaning. And so we have to understand part of our witnessing, we first have a relationship with that person. We have communication with that person. We get to know that person. And then on down the road, we share Christ with someone. And this is what he tells us, <coughs> excuse me, to do. But he had something that other men didn't have. He had the power of God on his life. And he healed. 
You know, very early in life, Mary realized there was something different about Jesus. And folks, it began at conception. Mary knew she had not slept with anyone. She was a virgin. And she had to be a virgin to, for Jesus to be the perfect son of God. So Jesus was special and Mary knew that. Look at Luke chapter uh, 2, verse 15. This is at the birth of Jesus, and we'll cover this later. But I want you to see the end of this paragraph. So it was when the angels had gone away to heaven, and the shepherds said to one another, let's now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they'd seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told of them concerning this child. What was the first thing they did after seeing Jesus? They went and told everybody about this special baby. Folks, Jesus is special. He is special. Verse 18, and all who heard it marveled at those things which were told them, told to them by the shepherds. And folks, shepherds didn't have the greatest reputation back then. Shepherds uh, didn't bathe every Saturday. Okay, shepherds didn't dress up for Sunday. Okay, so they were amazed. Now here's the verse, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. What was she doing? She was holding the Son of God. She birthed Jesus Christ. And folks, I believe when we get to heaven, I don't know about you, but the first person I want to meet and talk to is Jesus. Amen. He's done everything for you. He died on a cross for you. He saved you through his precious blood. Verse 20, then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things which they had heard and they had seen. Look over in verse 45 now. Mary knew there was something different about Jesus. And when he came onto the scene, there's no indication that John the Baptist healed anyone. But when Jesus came, everything changed. Everything changed. Look at verse 45, 2 verse 45. And again, Mary and Joseph were there at Jerusalem. They uh, all, you know, uh, family and all go there. And for some reason, and this happens, you know, they, they thought Jesus was maybe with a relative or somebody. All right. And you know, they went a day's journey away. And I don't know about you, but if, if, if our grandkids are 20 feet away and I can't see them, I start panicking, okay? we got to find these kids. They're my responsibility. Verse 45, so when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now it was so that after three days they found him in the temple. Now how many kids of all the places to go in Jerusalem would be hanging out at a temple? Think about that. Sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished. Twelve years old was astonished at his understanding and answers. So uh, when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? And look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And I know uh, uh, Joseph wasn't like my dad. My dad whooped me first and then started asking questions. Okay? <laughs> They were scared. Why would you do this to us? And I believe they, he wasn't disobeying his parents. He was so caught up in the teaching and the reading of the word, he was just tingle folk. I mean, even when he stayed, and it doesn't say where he stayed that night, I believe he was there early in the morning when the temple opened. And again, he was sharing and asking questions. There was something totally different about this man. But they, and he said unto them, why do you seek me? Do you not know that I must be about my father's business? He had a job. It was his father's business. 
It was to let everyone know who he was. But they did not understand the statement which they spoke to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. And his mother kept all these things in her heart. Remember later on when Jesus did his first miracle, the public miracle at the wedding? Remember what Mary said? Whatever Jesus tells you to do, just do it. Hey, Nike, did, Nike shouldn't have got that credit. <laughs> Mary said it. Just do it. And we know what happened there. Oh, folks, there was something special about Jesus. He healed the sick. Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. And here's what it started getting tricky. Jesus can heal what he wants. But if he starts saying he's forgiven people of sin, that got the scribes and the Pharisees' attention. Mark 2, and again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was, he was heard, it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together, so there was no longer room for them to receive them, not even the door. Wouldn't it be neat if I'm telling you our church got so on fire for God that the, you know, that I had to get up before the service started and say, would some of you members just step out in the hallway so those people can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ in here? Folks, Jesus can do that. Not us. Not for us to brag about it. It's people on fire for Jesus. And it says, uh, uh, together, so that no longer there was room to receive him, and he preached the word to them. There's his, one of his jobs. Then he came to him, bringing a parent who was uh, carried by four men. And when they not, could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they had let down the bed, which is in the parent, uh, was lying. The group below, I'm telling you, if they were some church members, they'd be griping because they tore their house up. They'd be griping because you got dirt and you got mud and you got dust on us. Folks, man, if someone wants to get, get to Jesus, don't stand in their way. Help them to Jesus. And when they saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. I am telling you, when he said that, you could have heard a pin drop there. No one had ever said that. No one claimed to be the Son of God except Jesus. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned with, uh, reason thus within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your heart? Which is easier to say the, to the paralytic, uh, your sins are forgiven, you or say, arise and take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has the power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately, that's the other thing about his healing. You know, immediately when he healed someone, it happened right then. He arose, took up his bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified, saying, we've never seen anything like this. Oh, folks, when you come face to face with Jesus, you are going to say, wow, wow. He is the Son of God. He has the gift of healing. Who is this man. He's not like everybody else. So we see Jesus preach the gospel. Jesus healed the sick, and Jesus raised the dead. Turn with me to John 11. John 11. And we know the story of Lazarus. Mary and Martha, they were good friends with Jesus. Uh, he had dined with them. He had stayed with them. Lazarus got sick, and they sent word to Jesus. Lazarus is really sick. And Jesus waited three days before he left. And the quickest question I want to ask you, which is the greatest miracle? 
healing someone who is sick, or raising someone from the dead. Jesus was going to do a miracle that astounded everyone that was at that cave or that grave site. And look at verse 20. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary's sitting in the house. All right, why was she sitting there? She was mad, okay? She wasn't coming out. And both of them said, if you would have been here, he would be alive. So they knew the power in the miracles of Jesus. Now Martha said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection in the last day. She was saying, I know you can do it, and I know you're going to do it. But, and Jesus said to her, man, this is one of my favorite scriptures in the word of God. I am the resurrection and the life. You want to live forever? You find Jesus. You put your faith and trust in Jesus. You repent of your sins and come to Him. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Oh, you may taste physical death, but you will not die that second death, which is being apart from God. And it says, do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you're the Christ the Son of God, who is coming again into the world. Now look down to verse 40. Jesus told him to take the stone away, and Martha said, oh, Jesus, you got to think about this. He's been there four, four days now. And Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you are always that you always hear me. But because of these people who are standing by, I say this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And I'm telling you, everybody around that tomb, was looking at the door of that tomb, just waiting. Is something going to happen? And he who died came out bound with foot, with foot and grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said, loose him and let him go. Folks, is this not a picture of salvation? We were dead in our trespasses and sin. There's no way for us to get to heaven on our own. But Jesus and God interrupted our life and said, I can help you. All you have to do is look unto Jesus. Repent of your sin. Invite Christ to come into your life. And I'm telling you from that day on, if you'll study the Gospels real hard, you will see that they, were, they started threatening Jesus' life from that day forward. I think when he said the forgiveness of sin, that ticked them off. But when they heard about this miracle, I am telling you, they were looking for ways to kill the Son of God. One last scripture, John 20. John 20. Don't you love it when God just does a certain thing and then he adds something to that miraculous thing? Look at John 20, verse 30. And truly, Jesus said, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus Christ is the, uh, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Name. Folks, you think about it. People think the greatest thing that happened was Lazarus being raised from the dead, but it isn't. The greatest thing that can happen to your life is you giving your heart and life to Jesus Christ, knowing that you spend an eternity in heaven with him, and you are accepted in the beloved. You are called a child of God. He loves you, and if there is one here today that doesn't know you, I am telling you, 
I am begging you, look at Scripture. You can be forgiven of all sin. You can start again. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his miracles. And God, I thank you for the miracle of salvation. God, I pray if there's one here and if the question is asked, if you were to die today, would you go to heaven? Lord, if it's no, if it's I hope so, I pray that they would give their heart and their life to you today. God, you're standing at the door. You're waiting. You are knocking, says Revelation. And God, I pray you would knock on people's hearts today. God, I pray that people would know they would be sure. 1 John 5, 13, these things you can know. You can know for sure. And God, I pray, Lord, everyone in here would be soul searching today. And God, there are Christians that need to rededicate their life to Christ. There are folks that could need to be, they could need to be baptized, God. And even move their letter or join our church. Lord, whatever you want to do today, God, we give you the glory. It's all about you. So God, this is your church. This is your invitation. God, thank you for who you are and what you've done for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet?